Well, Sean, this is the real concern, though. I mean, if the prosecutors can go down this road and everything you say there is absolutely correct, um, you go to a jury. It's a New York jury. Now, I'm from New York. I talk to New Yorkers all the time, and I know how a lot of New Yorkers feel about Donald Trump. What are the odds that this ridiculous, trumped up, so to speak, misdemeanor charge could actually put him in real legal jeopardy if they get 12 people on a jury to say, oh, this is our big chance to nail Trump? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no jury that won't convict him in New York. It's like the one in D.C. To find 12 people that don't fully agree. I mean, D.C., and I know it's, it's a little different in New York, but it's not far off. D.C. votes 95 to 98 percent Democrat. Like, you're not going to get a fair shake in either jurisdiction. So, one, I, I don't have any doubt in my mind that they'll get a conviction. It doesn't even matter what they're being asked to do. The answer that they said before the trial chart was, sure, yes, guilty. Uh, who, you know, what was he con what was he charged with? They, they didn't even care to find that out before they rendered a, a decision. So he's going to get found guilty. The, the upside is twofold. One, he will appeal. And two is I think most voters are going. So let me get this straight. This is a bookkeeping offense. It's a misdemeanor. It's not really going to affect anybody's decision to how to vote. Obviously, in many cases, the, the, the indictments themselves have actually increased his popularity among his base. And I think for a variety of, of independent voters, they see through it as well. Yeah, look, I hope you're right here, but it does feel very much like the old Stalin saying about show me the man and I'll show you the crime. But I want to go to another yeah. one of these cases here, which is what's happening down in Georgia. And there's been some wild developments in Georgia in the election interference case where District Attorney Fonnie Willis looks set to be disqualified. The whole case into Donald Trump's um, alleged election interference is in jeopardy now over claims she had an improper relationship with a prosecutor, she had brought on Nathan Wade. Now, there's a lot of allegations of financial propriety, um, conflict of interest, including today we learned that Wade allegedly paid for trips for the two of them together on his corporate card, and she reimbursed him in cash. Sean, what is happening here? And I mean, this whole thing just stinks to high heaven. Well, let's let's be clear about a couple of things. It's they can they're free to have any relationship that they want. What this really comes down to is what you just pointed out that it was he was getting paid. He's not a, he's not in their office. He was brought on as a special prosecutor to help with cases that weren't enumerated as having to do with Donald Trump at all. Then they this guy bills for hundreds of thousands of dollars and at the same time is taking her on expensive trips, cruises, et cetera. And He's saying, well, no, 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 don't worry. That's not a payoff because she's reimbursing me in cash. And then when on the stand today, she's saying, well, I keep a ton of cash up to $15,000 in my house. He doesn't so have I just any wanna, receipts for where. Uh, let's let's actually ahead. play. I've got a little grab of this here. Let's have a yeah. look at this because I think viewers really ought to see this. Have a look at this. But yes, ma'am. So let's talk about both of those. I know he initially paid for it. Did you pay him back? For the cruise and for Aruba. Yeah, I gave him his money before we ever went on that trip. You gave him cash before you ever went on the trip? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so when you got cash to pay him back on these trips, would you go to the ATM? No, lady. You would not go to the ATM? No. So saying no, lady, to the uh, to the attorney questioning her, this seems, um, I mean, but, the but whole thing worse, just seems because... bizarre. The reason, so just so we're clear, the reason she's asking her about the ATM is, hey, do you have a paper trail showing, you know, let, the trip was January 1st, here I am on January 2nd taking the cash out of an ATM, right, to show that there's a trail of this. So she says, no, of course I didn't go to the ATM or whatever, I just had it lying around. Then they ask him, Mr. Wade, where was this cash? Did you deposit it into the bank like a normal human being? And he's like, no, well, where was it? I don't, you know, might have just been in my pocket. So she has no trail of her getting the money. He has no trail of him. But we should supposed to just, you know, I just, it doesn't pass the smell test. So one person has a ton of cash just sitting around their house. The other person gets that, you know, a bunch of that cash and just kind of puts it in their pocket. And that's what we're supposed to leave. That's the, that is really what this comes down to is did Fanny, Fanny Willis put uh, her boyfriend on the payroll to go after these guys at an exorbitant amount of money. And then he's saying, hey, thanks a lot. Let's go on a cruise and I'll take care of it. Yeah, well, exactly right. I mean, this is this is the thing. I mean, it's like, as you say, adults can have whatever relationships they like, but if there's some personal romantic relationship that compromises his being hired, you know, that 
puts the whole question against Trump in jeopardy here. But I did love this here from Fonnie Willis, where she was asked to characterize the nature of their relationship. Have a look at this. I have had conversations with him um, since you filed the motion, but they wouldn't be substantive to this. He sent me uh, very nice uh, sermons that, that have been done. Apparently they were just sending each other sermons. Look, I, I see the, the look on her face throughout that entire courtroom appearance said it all. She was pissed that she had to be there and explain herself to him. And it's funny, the, the, this goes to, to all these folks on the left. They believe that they are above the law, that they can do what they want if they're pursuing people on the right, but they don't believe that they have to abide by the law themselves, right? There's this, they, Mr. Wade was asked several questions about his billing practices, how he paid for things on a corporate card versus a personal card, cash versus not cash. And they, they just are so dismissive of this. I don't, they don't think that they have to abide by any of the same rules and that they found it so appalling that they had to answer these questions today. Well, I mean, Sean, you could even say that maybe just some of those are bookkeeping misdemeanors. I don't know. But I want to move on, though, to this other oh, incredible very good. To this, to, uh, thank you, other incredible story here where the U.S. government is being accused of hiding documents that incriminates the intelligence community for spying and election interference on the uh, Trump campaign as far back as 2016. Michael Schellenberger on his Substack account revealed that CIA asked foreign allies to spy on 26 associates of Donald Trump. Trump in the lead up to the 2016 election, which triggered the allegations that Trump's campaign had falsely been colluding with Russia. Now, Trump's been saying this for years. No one listened. What do you make of all of this? I, I just, you know, as somebody who is there at Trump Tower throughout the campaign, the funny thing is prior to our victory, the narrative was that we couldn't collude with ourselves. We were a bunch of bozos that, you know, it was a joke what we were doing. Then we win. And it's like, well, of course, you couldn't have actually pulled this off. It must have been some outside entity. And we keep pull, peeling back that onion, you know, year after year, month after month, and we find out what the underlying documents were, the Steele dossier, the amount of information, the 51 intelligence agencies that dismissed Hunter Biden's laptop falsely. There is this, it, you cannot help but look at the mountain of evidence that's there and really wonder what was going on prior to the lead up of that election. And, the, and to your point, it's, it's, it's these journalistic endeavors that find pieces out. And whenever it happens, you notice that it wasn't NBC News or ABC News or the Washington Post or the New York Times. It's these independent journalists that are, aren't afraid to reveal the actual truth of what's going on. The bigger question though that I have is, is there, is there going to be any accountability? We, we saw the, this entire thing with the Steele dossier and the Mueller report. How many people's lives were ruined? How many millions of dollars were in billable hours to lawyers to prove something that never existed? Yeah, and it was really, I guess, Sean, undermining democracy. Very quickly, what's about all this talk about a binder of documents that would have incriminated intelligence agencies that might have been the real target of the Mar-a-Lago raid? Well, I, look, here's what I've known, I've realized, is that over the last, what, six, seven years, that uh, you know what what normally would have been out of the the scope of of even normal thought process is now something that every one of these things needs to be investigated and we need to get answers and it's amazing mm. how many things that I I if you had told me in 2016 that there was going to be a dossier compiled that was peddled by the opponent's campaign and yet credibly viewed by the FBI and the other intelligence agencies, I would have said, you're crazy. It was funny, uh, just one quick anecdote. I was actually, because I maintain a security clearance, I was in the room when Donald Trump was briefed by the intelligence agencies uh, after our election. I think it was January 6, 2016. I was in that room. I was part of the briefing. I watched Director Comey go up to him afterwards and talk about what became known as Annex A, the Steele dossier. And yet I would have reporters call me and tell me what happened in that meeting? And I'd say, no, that's not true. I was there. And they were like, well, mm. we we have sources. And I'd say there were six people in that room, seven people, eight people in the room. Uh, that's just not true. They've been sold a bill of goods. The American press has been weaponized against Trump and all of these folks on the right. And they have they they just continue to make up false narratives. They suppress things, as we saw in the last election. They're colluding with big tech. It continues to give us pause and, and undermine confidence in all these institutions, especially our own government. Sean Spicer, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time, your insights, and your analysis, Sean Spicer.